And now, it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsi. At this point of the show, we are going to get to the Kennedy crime family. I think we're on part five. Uh, and yes, we will be getting to the uh, John Kennedy elections and uh, covering all of that stuff, but not this week. Uh, so last week we spoke about Joe Kennedy and everything that was laid out before him. He had left Hollywood, but had tried to weasel his way into Roosevelt's cabinet, but that didn't work either. And eventually he, along with Roosevelt's son, Jimmy, heads over to Europe. As we said last week, he got pretty much in bed with Winston Churchill and through Churchill was able to wrestle control of doors, uh, Gordon's Hagen Hague and other companies. It simply meant when prohibition was repealed, which it would be that Kennedy had a market on importing booze from Europe. Uh, Jimmy Roosevelt was along for the ride to get wealthy and don't think that president Roosevelt didn't gain something out of that either. Uh, Roosevelt knew Kennedy was a fucking scumbag on every level, but, um, you know, I never met anybody who said that money smelled, you know, who didn't shove it in their pockets. So Kennedy used the power of the president not just to attain medical licenses, but also to use the power of the president just to get special conditions and even got himself head of the Maritimes, which to the mafia was like the goose that laid the golden egg. Uh, one of the aspects that I want to address, because invariably one of you is going to ask how can the Kennedy say that Joe Kennedy had no organized crime contacts, especially when Joe was seen with Frank Costello and others and his date book backs up what we've long suspected. Uh, they've always spun Joe Kennedy as a financial wizard and a moneymaker, uh, a deal maker. Uh, think Donald Trump. However, you know, Trump is not and never has been a deal maker. Uh, he used daddy's money to attain his wealth. Uh, Trump is not a bright guy. Trump uh, was handed his first $5 million from daddy and was an epic failure for most of his life. Uh, and I'm not getting into the whole political side of that, but Trump is one of those guys whose name does sell. Uh, well, it used to anyway, uh, but Trump's businesses have always been in the red, not quite the massive, massive success story that he's been trying to sell you and everybody else for years. And this is why Trump has fought so hard to hide his taxes because it's going to show massive losses. And to somebody like Trump, whose ego is based on money, cannot keep the lie going about how wealthy, he is, how wealthy he actually is when factually it can be proven how much in debt he truly is. Uh, just facts. Um, so I make that comparison between Joe Kennedy in the, in the same way, but the difference is, is Joe Kennedy actually made millions but not from an honest point of view. He was a fucking criminal. So off goes Joe and Jimmy uh, to settle the booze contracts. And, and that's when Roosevelt decides to end prohibition. His son, Joe, uh, his son and Joe have completely, you know, essentially cornered the market. They kick back to Winston Churchill, who can acquire permits for them and less eyes on the ports in Europe. Uh, and those are just facts. Uh, just for dates sake, Kennedy and Roosevelt went to Europe months prior to the repeal of prohibition, which prohibition came into effect or the repeal of prohibition came into effect December 5th of 1933. Uh, now, the Maritimes, Kennedy didn't take over till 1937. So I don't want anybody to get confused there, but we will touch on our narcotics stuff at some point. There was also some belief that Kennedy was uh, involved at some point with the IRA, which is a bit of a leap. But in any event, uh, 1929 was a horrific year for the mafia. February 14th of 29, Lincoln Park, Chicago. Al Capone ends the life of seven rivals and one of the bloodiest, most publicized hits in American history. And we will know this as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. That hit was 
uh, designed by members of the Capone group, wanted to remove stalwart Bugsy Moran from the booze wars and wanted to, to basically take full control of the north side of Chicago. While both sides had been going at it for years, it was the theft of booze by Moran's group, uh, barrels of whiskey coming down from Canada through the Detroit River, which infuriated Capone, who from Florida ordered those murders. Uh, on that very morning, Peter Gusenberg, Frank Gusenberg, Albert Kalachek, uh, Kalachek Adam Heyer, uh, Reinhard Schwimmer, Albert Weinshank, and John May were all Tommy gunned to death against a brick wall in a warehouse. Moran had long been a thorn in Capone's side and continued to rob liquor shipments based in Detroit. Something had to be done, right? So Capone made the call and the rest is sort of history. And, and I don't want to revisit the step-by-step step in the entire fiasco, but it was a major problem for organized crime. The cops were furious, the city was furious, and the mafia on top of it was furious. Specifically, Lucky Luciano was irate. Now keep in mind, at the time, Luciano was just a lieutenant and the mafia was not yet a boss. As the Castamarese War was coming and Luciano, uh, you know, wouldn't get rid of Masseria and Maranzano and take over until 1931. And I wanted to say that because some may get confused as to how how and why Luciano was leading the Atlantic City Conference, but was not an actual boss. And you have to remember that Masseria and Maranzano were not actually invited to that conference. Uh, and a, excuse me, <clears throat> and I would love to tell you. Uh, how that went to be accepted, but I just don't have that answer for you. And they probably entrusted others to handle it. Uh, by contrast, uh, Joe Bonanno wasn't invited to that meeting either because he was not trusted and he was Maranzano's number two. So in May of 1909, excuse me, 1929, specifically the days between May 13th and 16th, the who's who of organized crime would travel to Atlantic City for a big meeting. There were also They were also there to celebrate the nuptials of the mob's financier, Meyer Lansky. The meeting was a big one because the mob needed to address what happened back in February and they wanted the bootlegging wars to end. Uh, they didn't like the heat from police and they also wanted to discuss what the mafia was going to do once prohibition ended and how could they take advantage of the booze trade once prohibition was finally, you know, over with. Uh, and they wanted to discuss the trajectory of organized crime and just how they would eventually move on to become a national crime syndicate. Uh, the mob knew once prohibition ended, they would lose million dollars as a result and how they could essentially get into legitimized liquor imports ahead of time and how they could diverse, diversify their holdings in illegal rackets to offset the loss from bootlegging. As I said, with Lansky getting married <clears throat> and Luciano wanting to have a summit of sorts, they made their plans. Uh, Nucky Johnson handled all the arrangements and messages in hotel rooms. The hosts of this meeting would be Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano, and Johnny the Fox Torrio. And here is the actual guest list. Uh, Johnny Torrio, Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, Nucky Johnson, Joe Adonis, Vito Genovese, Albert Anastasia, Frank Scalish, Vincent Mangano, Tommy Lucchese, Willie Moretti, Bugsy Siegel, Louis Lepke Buckhalter, Jacob Shapiro, Charlie the Bug Workman, Long East Wiltman, Dutch Schultz, Oni Madden, Frank Erickson, Sox Lanza, Al Capone, Frank Nitty, Jake Guzik, Frank Rio, Frank McErlane, Waxy Gordon, Harry Rosen, Max Hoff, Irving Bitts, uh, Charlie Schwartz, Mo Dalitz, Louis Rothkop, Leo Berkowitz, Abe Bernstein, Joe Bernstein, Charlie Sullivan, John Lazia, Santos Traficante Sr., Sam Silver Dollar Corolla, Frank Morelli, Frank Cucciara, Sammy Lazar, and Joseph Kennedy. Cities represented were Florida, Providence, Boston, New York, Cleveland, Detroit, Kansas City, Philadelphia, Louisiana, Chicago, and New Jersey. Now, as I said last week, I cannot show you a, a photo of this event, okay, with Joe Kennedy there. But what I do have is corresponding dates in his books, his ledgers, and his logs. And basing that on what Kennedy was doing with the mafia already on the ports and the docks, and also with the phone number that he left where he could be reached during that specific time period, puts him in Atlantic City or right around that area. Coincidence? I think not. Uh, remember, who ran horse tracks in Florida at the time? What did Kennedy buy down the road? Hialeah, 
Uh, and so I don't believe in, in coincidences, especially not with the Kennedys. So, like I said, uh, there were those who were not invited. Joe Bonanno, whom nobody trusted, was not invited to the meeting. And the reason was because he was Maranzano's number two. And nobody trusted that he would keep his mouth shut. As we've always said on this show, Luciano and others never really fully trusted Joe Bonanno and his waffling. Once the Castamolaresi war begins, created uncertainty in the eyes of Luciano. So Bonanno was not invited, nor was Joe Profaci, because he was another one they didn't trust. As well as Maranzano and Massaria, they were not invited either. But I really find it hard to believe that somehow word did not trickle back to them that there was a big meeting. Uh... But we'll never know. A lot of what Luciano and Torrio wanted to express was that the old world beliefs in the ethnic lines should be uh, withdrawn, uh, that everything was too old fashioned and organized crime was from every for everyone, not just specifically Italians, which is what Maranzano and Masseria believed in. Only Italians, only Sicilians, nothing else. Uh, they hated Frank Costello because he was Calabrian. So. Uh, one of the first things discussed at this meeting is what led to the uh, vicious murders in Chicago. And while they understood the principles involved in the turf wars and the bootlegging wars, but they off, they also felt that there were other ways to handle those problems and that Capone had brought a massive amount of heat on everybody because of his actions. Luciano and others believed that there were other ways to handle business and that was there was enough room <coughs> for everyone to make money and that the infighting in cities was a direct reason for the St. Valentine's Day massacre. Luciano would explain that Capone had acted, acted recklessly, and he ordered that Capone, whom, who was traveling actually to Philadelphia on business on the 17th of that month, needed to carry a gun on him and allow himself to be arrested, as law enforcement had been looking to talk to him since the massacre actually happened. Luciano expressed that law enforcement had a need for action, and that Capone needed to provide that. Luciano knew Capone would take the pinch, and he would probably do a short amount of time, but it was needed for law enforcement to back the fuck off of organized crime. Uh, Capone didn't like it and argued against it, but he ended up doing what he was told, and he would be arrested in Philadelphia on the 17th and charged with concealing a weapon and would get a year in prison, but he would out, be out in nine months. But that was truly, really the beginning of the end for Al Capone. Another topic at the meeting was the expansion of gambling. The mob needed ideas as to what to do when Prohibition ended. While the mob had four years until Prohibition would officially end, they wanted assurances from Kennedy that the shipments would continue to come in without hesitation, and the mob wanted to control whatever time they had left to Prohibition. Uh, with Joe Kennedy controlling interests of booze coming in from Europe and owning several ships and ports, uh, it would be business as usual. They also discussed wanting the violence in Chicago to end by all means necessary, but that portion of the meeting wouldn't be that much of a concern as Capone essentially would be done in Chicago in a relatively short period of time. So an agreement that was made was that booze, the booze wars would completely stop. No more shots would be fired by anybody. Constant competition for importing needed to stop, and this is where Kennedy comes into play. Kennedy, Kennedy would essentially import everything he wanted because he had the medical license to do that, which meant that he could begin to stockpile at various warehouses. And this is one of the reasons why, when you look back at where Kennedy's warehouses were, they're found in some interesting places. Uh, every point of contact where Kennedy owned warehouses were sort of middle sections of the map of organized crime, New York, Boston, Ohio, Detroit. From there, everything would be expanded outward. And I think we talked about that like two weeks ago. Uh, anything from Canada came in through Detroit and shipped right out. Because the mafia controlled the docks, especially in New York, there were zero complications. Remember, we talked about the barrels of booze found in various warehouses, which was not accounted for. But when asked, Kennedy explained it was a storage for barrels that were owned by his banks, but not him personally. But we know that's not true because of the letters he received from his partner about the barrels being moved out to their quote unquote friends. Uh, another facet was discussing how the mob could pull their money together and completely control a monopoly on the booze business itself. The problem was they didn't know specifically at the time that Kennedy had moved in completely on that racket. It simply meant that Kennedy would cut back the price to the mafia because the volume would be 10 times what it normally would be. 
Uh, for Kennedy, there was zero risk. He controlled the narrative. The mob might have controlled everything from point B to C, but Kennedy controlled A, point A, and that was the most important part. Uh, Kennedy could get it to them, which is what made that relationship between them function and work so well. So without Kennedy, forget it. I mean, prior to Kennedy's help, uh, they had issues getting everything they wanted across borders, especially from Canada. That was a big issue for them. Now, with Kennedy's and the keys to the, the castle, they really didn't risk anything. They knew occasionally Kennedy would rob their booze. Uh, and it came, it just came with the territory. They were well aware he would feign false insurance claims and that they were okay with that because it was basically Kennedy protecting himself and scamming the government. And they got their cut out of that as well. So they, they kind of knew that going into it. Uh, the mob also would decide that with whatever time they had left uh, during prohibition, that they would all begin to move into nightclubs and that booze supplied in these nightclubs would be completely controlled by them. But the booze would be deployed or distributed by bars and restaurants specifically. We know this to be the case because Kennedy owned scotch was being served illegally at places like the Copacabana and other famous uh, places. So it just proves that the mob relied on Kennedy for that. Uh, if not, how the hell did Kennedy owned booze end up in the most famous places in the city when prohibition hadn't been lifted? So once again, it's the argument the Kennedy people make that that never happened, but we know that it did. Uh, also at this meeting, there was a discussion about tying in a national racing wire, which would be received in casinos for bookmaking and horse racing. It was basically a national racing wire for horse betters. And the idea came from Al Capone, who explained that Moses Annenberg, uh, who enforced the distribution of Randolph Hearst's newspapers in Chicago, could handle that. The New York and Chicago uh, would oversee those direct operations if they went ahead with the plan. Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello were chosen by Luciano to handle those affairs for the New York side of things, and Moses Annenberg and Frank Erickson were chosen to handle the Chicago side of those things. The group would agree in principle to expand into gambling, bookmaking, and more, uh, and that would offset any projected loss if and when prohibition would end. They would then have a discussion to break up turf and hand over franchises and territory to others within the mafia. It was the very early beginning stages to basically form uh, the mafia handing over territories. If Kennedy knew when the end of prohibition was coming, he likely didn't utter a fucking word to anybody in attendance uh, because it, it would have benefited him. It would have benefited him more to just keep quiet. It's also at this meeting that Luciano lays out the plans for the future. He explains that Masseria and Maranzano would have to go in due time, and that they would it, it would take some time to get it done. At this meeting, it was decided that Lansky and uh, the Lansky and Bugsy Siegel crime family would be disbanded, and that a new group would be ushered in. That group would eventually become known as Murder Incorporated, but for the time being, Luciano wanted everybody on the same page. Chicago, Detroit, Boston, and Philadelphia agree to fully back up Luciano and New York. When the shit hit the fan and Luciano moved on Maranzano and Masseria and the rest we kind of know is, is history. Uh, so Chicago, Detroit, Boston, Philadelphia said, you're going to go to war. You need shooters. We'll give them to you. So everybody was in on it. So and that, that also gives some clarification too of Luciano's decision. Remember when we talked about Sun Tzu earlier about preparation, that is preparation, knowing that, I could probably do this myself, but I need to know that if it gets hairy, I've got one, two, three, four, five different crime families in different cities going to back me. That's that's preparation. Uh, so while I said earlier that I can't show you a photo of Kennedy at this meeting, everything sort of coincides with what happened. Kennedy was too integral to the mafia uh, to one, not be there. And number two, everything I have or I have sitting in front of me sort of proves that he was there, or at least if he wasn't sitting at the table with them, there were messages being sent, but I personally believe he was there. So as we know, Roosevelt would end the Volstead Act or the Prohibition Act in 1933. Kennedy and the Mafia got tremendously wealthy. Uh, Kennedy, while he had been involved in many unscrupulous things, still wanted more. He still wanted that power. He wanted... Uh, to be in Roosevelt's inner circle and was still miffed as to why Roosevelt hadn't budged and put him in his cabinet. So in 1936, Roosevelt needs Kennedy's help and needs it badly, which might as well have been the greatest news ever to, to Joe Kennedy. 
Uh, Roosevelt needed money for his campaign. He needed votes and he just needed serious help. Kennedy would do the usual huge fundraisers and would even put or excuse me, <coughs> would even pen the biggest bullshit ass kissing book ever written entitled I'm for Re Roosevelt by Joe Kennedy. Kennedy used his contacts in Hollywood and New York to push that book. The book, which was co-authored by author Kroc, who was a New York Times columnist, presented arguments for why businessmen should support Roosevelt and the New Deal. Remember, Kennedy was totally against the New Deal because wealthy businessmen were about to be held to higher standards and would likely lose millions of dollars. Uh, Kennedy's quick turnaround is pretty astonishing, but he's a snake, right? So he knows what he's doing. Uh, the book was actually told from the perspective of Joe Kennedy and his personal endorsement of Roosevelt. The book had a huge, I mean, huge significant impact on the business community and basically gets Roosevelt reelected. And this is why Kennedy is handed the chair of the U S maritime commission. And it's laughable because the only fucking experience that Kennedy had was running the shipyard. And remember in those days, Roosevelt and Kennedy got into some knockdown dragouts over Kennedy's criminal shit. Uh, and basically it just enabled Kennedy to control ships, make ships into cargo ships, which he would use for very interesting things. 10 months in Kennedy quits. So, this is a title. Kennedy threatens to have Father Coughlin whacked if he doesn't shut his fucking mouth. So here we go. Father Charles Coughlin, who was an Irish Canadian priest in Detroit, was an outspoken critic of Roosevelt. It wasn't always that way, as Father Coughlin supported Roosevelt for a long time. However, Coughlin had a radio show where he spoke about finances and political issues and had a huge following, millions of people. And this is back in the, the day. So that, that's a huge audience. Coughlin would go on rants, much like Jeff Canarsi, bashing Roosevelt and would have anti-communist, anti-Semitic, far-right, anti-federal, reserve, and isolationist radio rants. Roosevelt worried that the priest's nut job antics and rants uh, would hurt him, and he would end up sending Kennedy to speak to Father Coughlin. Whatever that conversation was, it didn't work because Father Coughlin, like I said, who had millions of listeners, swung his support for Huey Long, who was a bigger criminal than Kennedy in 1935. He then swing, swings his prick for a guy by the name of William uh, Lem, Lemkes? Lemkes, yeah, who was a union party leader in 1936. Kennedy, who once opposed the New Deal, was now all in favor for it and grew frustrated, as did Roosevelt with Coughlin's antics. Coughlin would go on a barrage of tirades about how the New Deal didn't go far enough and that Roosevelt was just a pawn of the wealthy. Roosevelt had heard enough. Roosevelt calls a meeting with Joe Kennedy, Pope Pius XII, who at that time was known as Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli, and Bishop Spellman. What Roosevelt wanted was the Catholic Church to shut Coughlin the fuck up because he's going to lose. He's going to lose the election if this guy keeps running his fucking mouth. The first thing was to get him on the same level. Uh, the first thing was they threatened Coughlin with defrocking him and throwing him out of the Catholic Church. Well, that's only going to be pushed. But so far, when that didn't work, they had him removed from the air. They took him off the air. Coughlin swore then that he would speak no matter what the church, the Roosevelt, or Kennedy, or the goons did. Kennedy then, once again, has to sit down with Roosevelt, and Roosevelt demands he goes and sees Coughlin and gets it into his head. Kennedy, in no certain terms, explained that if Coughlin didn't stop, there would be consequences way beyond getting tossed out of the church, and that there were ways to get him to conform or else. Coffin would get in line, stop his rants, and then was able to return to the air in 1940. What's funny is even after Kennedy threatened him, for whatever reason, Father Coughlin would always claim he and Kennedy were friends, and he would call Kennedy the shining star among the dim nights in the Roosevelt administration. I told you Kennedy was an evil fuck. <laughs> You know, and one of the questions you might ask, considering that Roosevelt and Kennedy butted, headed, butted heads, 
for years before that and years after is did Kennedy even like Roosevelt? And I don't think he did. I think he fucking hated him, but he simply used him and he used blackmail against him to get what he wanted. Think about what would have happened if Kennedy opened his mouth about some of the business dealings or some of the seedier side of government. It would have been a big thing if Kennedy had unveiled that he got illegal medical licenses from Roosevelt or how he and Roosevelt's son and Roosevelt made millions and millions of dollars for illegal booze. How would it have gone down had Kennedy opened his mouth and explained how he cheated at stocks and swindled millions of people? And then Roosevelt makes him the head of the SEC. I mean, if Roosevelt wasn't one, of, if he wasn't one of the dirtiest fucking presidents besides Johnson, I don't know who was. And I get it. It's politics. And if you think that Kennedy didn't use the mob swing votes for Roosevelt, you'd be out of your fucking minds. Kennedy's power was not truly derived from organized crime, but rather the Rockefeller types. Those with the money make the rules. It's funny because, you know, Kennedy hated Jewish people. I mean, he despised them. And we will find out in the coming weeks to what extremes he was willing to go to tell people that, which included backing up Adolf Hitler and everything Hitler was doing. Pretty crude shit, to be honest, but without the Jewish people, Kennedy could have never done half the shit that he was ever able to accomplish. It's sort of like biting the hand that feeds you. But that's who Joe Kennedy was. Nice to your face, plotting behind your back, and doing whatever he could to fuck you while you were asleep at the wheel. And Roosevelt would be no different than anybody else. What Kennedy truly wanted was to be president. He wanted to control the United States. He wanted that power. And because of his lack of political acumen, he simply took the back door into politics, appearing as if he was a wealthy, intelligent guy. But the realities were that the American public had zero clue how Kennedy attained his wealth or the sheer amount of awful shit that he did to get there. So if he couldn't get inside the cabinet of Roosevelt, because largely the truth is Roosevelt knew he was a fucking snake, but It's a snake that he needed to keep his clutches on the country. And it was worth it to him. But the entire time, Kennedy is backstabbing and plotting to overthrow Roosevelt if he can possibly do it. He just needs an opening. And the plan is simple. Back Roosevelt publicly, then admonish him behind his back to other world leaders. Do whatever he could to snipe away at Roosevelt. Kennedy had what no other real president had before, and that was the backing of the most elite in this country. He had power and friends, and that power was dealt with and handled with votes. Kennedy, by proxy, could call the shots. Roosevelt, I think, at the end of the day, knew that Kennedy was a fucking scuzz bucket, but he had to keep him happy because an unhappy Joe Kennedy, as we have Uh, seen in the last four weeks meant some dangerous ass shit. The end goal was world domination. Let's not, I'm not talking about new world order or shit like that, but it was world domination. Kennedy wanted control of everything. The presidency was not enough. Kennedy's ego couldn't allow for just the presidency. He wanted to control the world. That some of you may scoff at that idea, but that's just the reality. The presidential uh, nomination was just the stepping stone for what Kennedy wanted. You imagine if that prick became president and loved Adolf Hitler? Holy shit. One only has to ask, why on earth would you back Adolf Hitler? And that should be enough for most of you to say, yeah, you're right. Total piece of shit and scumbag. So next week, when we do come back, good old Uncle Clobbercrotch somehow finagles Roosevelt into making him the ambassador to the court of St. James, which would turn out to be a fucking nightmare. While Roosevelt is going to run again in 1940 against Wendell Wilkie, here is Uncle Nutsy behind behind the surface doing everything he can to ensure that Roosevelt loses to Willie. 
He even tells the British press, Roosevelt will lose and he will fall badly. Making him an ambassador to the United Kingdom is the closest Kennedy is ever going to get as he is about to destroy his legacy and any chance that he has of appearing something other than a fucking dusty criminal ghoul who just creeped out of the dirt to drink the blood of lonely virgins. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little descriptive. So is Uncle Clobbercrotch. <laughs> I don't know. I just find that funny. Uncle Clobbercrotch. So next week when we come back, we're going to see how good old Joey gives himself a jolly good rogering and how he destroys himself and almost destroys the country in the process. And because of all of these things he starts to do and the, the public humiliation he's going to suffer when he starts to go on his anti-Jewish rants, basically saying Hitler was doing the right thing, which is highly fucking disturbing. So he ruins his reputation but he still wants world domination. He still wants to be the politically elite. He's no longer an ambassador. It becomes basically the scourge of America, but he's still wealthy as fuck, right? Still got his mob contacts, but because he can't attain what he truly wants, he has an idea. And his idea is a very simple one. I want my pro my son to be president of the United States. Because Joe honestly believed he could control his son in the Oval Office. That's what it's all about. And I would love to tell you that, that John F. Kennedy had this great political backbone and he believed in X, Y, Z and he was going to change America and he was he really gave a shit. But the one that was pulling his purse strings was his father. That's what it was all about. Even going back to P.J. Kennedy at the beginning. We saw the earmarkings of a wannabe politician and a scumbag, wealthy prick. And Joe Kennedy basically takes the model that PJ had and expands it in ways that nobody ever thought was possible. So next week when we come back, shit's going to get real interesting. And uh, Uncle Clobber Crotch uh, is going to start waving a Nazi flag. And he's going to ruin everything he's ever tried to attain. And the interesting thing is, if you know anything about the Kennedys and Joe Kennedy specifically, that was the end of his life for the most part. The second that he backs Hitler and starts saying stupid, awful, horrible shit. And when London starts to get bombed, he takes off to save his own family instead of being the ambassador, which is his motherfucking job. He corrals his whole family and they run and flee into the countryside so they can't be touched. Shows you what a fucking coward he was. And then when the Nazi shit comes to light, it's over for Joe Kennedy. But there's a shining star who came out of Uncle Clobber Crotch's nuts. John F. Kennedy. So I hope you're getting something out of the Kennedy thing. I hope you're enjoying it. Hopefully you're not going to sue me for calling him Uncle Clobber Crotch. <laughs> That's a Gloria Swanson joke, I guess. We will see everybody same back to Mob Talk Radio. Uh, just looking at the time. Uh, I think we're going to skip Sun Tzu Part 3, and that'll be definitely next week. It's already done. Uh, but if I do it, we're going to be here for three and a half hours today. And I'm not trying to do that. Uh, it's the weekend. I want to get a couple of days rest. I got some film stuff I got to do. So we will do that next week, I promise, along with another big Q&A and et cetera. And I'm going to try to squeeze in this weekend a Mob Talk Radio Live. I just need a couple. I just need a day to just figure out what I want to talk about on a live. So uh, let's get right into the Kennedy Crime Family Part Six. So this week is going to be well, it's going to be pretty egregious. Uh, we pretty much are going to confirm what we always knew about Uncle Cobblecock, and in fact, he's going to resemble someone more like Doctor Fucking Evil than a Bostonian aristocrat. Uh, Joe Kennedy from day one, his entire sort of way of thinking was, what can I take? What can I get done? And what can I fucking steal? Uh, Joe wasn't much different from his father, PJ. PJ had a, a small criminal political dealings. And in some instances uh, of, you know, like minor criminal shit, like I said, uh, P what PJ loved the most about politics was the dirty, seedy side to everything. Uh, nothing pleased him more than blackmail. 
Uh, Joe was like PJ in that regard. It wasn't below blackmail either, but Joe took blackmail to like a completely Darth Vader type of level. <laughs> if he couldn't buy what he wanted, he forced you to sell under the auspice of blackmail, letters, photos, whisper campaigns, and even false criminal charges like the ones we saw him pull against the fake rape charges and those allegations that were set forth during his days in Hollyweird. Uh, Joe's goal at first was money and power and prestige, but really what Joe wanted was the White House. And he would do anything he could to get there using Roosevelt like a fiddle. And I'd love to tell you that Roosevelt, you know, just fell for it, or he stood up against tyranny in the face of evil. But Roosevelt was really not much different than Kennedy at the end of the day. Uh, Roosevelt had some scruples, whereas Kennedy had absolutely none. He would do whatever he could to get to the top. He bankrupted thousands of people and gained immense wealth stealing, robbing, and creating hostile takeovers. It was Sam Giancana who once said of Joe Kennedy, he's the biggest gangster I've ever met in my fucking life. Uh, and that's probably astute. So the question before we begin sort of an almost final week on Joe Kennedy for the most part is this. If we apply what we know about gangsters, if we apply what we've seen in other mobsters, was Joe Kennedy different in any sort of capacity? And at the end of the day, he was not a boot, he was a bootlegger, he was a drug dealer, he was a thief, right? Uh, Roy, DeMe Roy DeMeo became a member of a bank's leadership. It's the same thing that Kennedy did. It's a play right out of Kennedy's book. So the question becomes, how far removed is Kennedy from, the mo from mob guys? He's really not. How far is Kennedy going to go? And when we left off last week, Kennedy went on record saying that Roosevelt was finished. It's a symptom of backstabbing and laying the trap for Roosevelt again, attaining the White House and anything that Kennedy could do to facilitate his own rise. He was going to do. However, World War II is coming fast and Kennedy's about to essentially insert his own foot into his mouth, ruining whatever reputation he once had, if it was even a good one and ensuring that the Oval Office was never going to be his. Never. However, with Kennedy, there's always a backup plan. And while you might suspect that that would come in the form of Bobby or John, it wasn't. He had plans for Joe Kennedy Jr. And that gets erased almost immediately as the war begins. Well, not almost immediately. 1944, I think, to be specific. And that's sort of when the Kennedy curse, if you believe in that, sort of begins. And like I said, this isn't going to be a huge segment today because I, I had to reach a certain cutoff point, so don't get mad. So in 1938, Roosevelt appoints Joe Kennedy as the United States ambassador to the court of St. James. His job duty specifically meant that he was a liaison of the United States government, the United States president to the United Kingdom, to the prime minister, and then to the monarchy. It's been said that it's one of the most prestigious posts in the United States Foreign Service because of the close relationships between the United States and the United Kingdom. That position has been held historically uh, for some of the biggest names in politics, John Adams, James Monroe, John Quincy Adams, Martin Van Buren, and James Buchanan, just to name a few. Uh, it's long sort of been a stepping stone for people who have, uh, to become ambassadors. And when they do, they usually typically... Uh, become the next or sometimes down the road president of the United States. It's also worth noting that many of the, those chosen for that position were often handed the job because they were major political contributors and fundraisers from both sides of the aisle. So in other words, it's a job you attain not necessarily by qualifications, but by ass kissing and how much you do for the president's reelection efforts uh, and just election efforts in general. The duties by the ambassador is to present United States policies to the government of the United Kingdom and its citizens, as well as report British policies and views back to the United States. Uh, and basically, in layman's terms, it's a middleman message sender. That's really all it is. And the ambassador is simply the head of the United States Consular Service in the United Kingdom. The ambassador serves as the primary channel of communications between two nations and plays an important role in treaty negotiations, also directing diplomatic activity in support of trade, and the ambassador is ultimately responsible for visa services and for the provision of consular support to the American citizens in the United Kingdom and oversees cultural relations between two countries. Uh, prior ambassadors did their jobs. However, this is about to become a glowing ghoul shit show as Kennedy steps in. Remember the job descriptions we just went through. 
You are a fucking messenger. The direct line between one country's president and another country's prime minister in the monarchy. Nowhere does it say in this job description, bootlegging, booze hounding, hobnobbing with aristocrats and lining your motherfucking pockets and disparaging an entire country. That's not in the job description, but that's what Joe Kennedy basically fucking does. Um, that's exactly what Uncle Creepy Crotch is about to do. Uh, and in short order. And what Kennedy hoped for in all reality was to get backing in Europe for his eventual thoughts of running, at least if it was a passing thought. This is what he needed to do, and it looked good on his resume. But like I said, he essentially stepped on landmines nonstop. So Kennedy's entire plan was to succeed Roosevelt in 1940. Almost as soon as Kennedy arrives, he begins to frequent high society, attending lavish parties, royal festivities, and he would actually spend the weekend at Windsor Castle with King George and Queen Elizabeth. And as the war drums began to beat, Kennedy is utterly against the war. Kennedy personally felt that the United States had no business getting involved in a war that didn't have anything to do with our country. He especially was pissed off that Roosevelt was sending aid to Britain and even helping them. And he makes his first public speech as ambassador at the London Pilgrim Club. And those in attendance, obviously, you know, because this is Joe's thing, it was the elite of British society and politics. And Kennedy stuns everyone in the crowd by saying that America and its best interests were to stay neutral in any conflict with Germany and that the United States would not see eye to eye with Britain as we had done in previous years. And, you know, it really takes balls to say that considering he's the fucking ambassador uh, and he's living in that country. It, it's disrespectful. It was against everything Roosevelt stood for, against everything our country believed in. However, in September of 1938, uh, after the Anschluss with Austria, Adolf Hitler annexes the German-speaking portions of Czechoslovakia, and then a year later, Hitler's blitzkrieg overruns Poland, setting off a major crisis both in London and Paris as how to respond to Germany's aggression. Uh, a year earlier, Britain had given Poland its assurances that if it were attacked by Germany, Britain would come to her aid. In the days and months after the German invasion, neither France nor Britain took any military action against Germany. This period was known as the Phony War when the British and the French army stood their ground and let Germany prepare to gobble up basically all of Europe. In time, German forces would invade both Norway and Denmark. By the middle of 1940, Hitler's troops successfully marched on Belgium and in Holland. In June, Hitler rode triumphantly into Paris and conquered the City of Lights. Uh, with the fall of France, Britain stood alone against Nazi Germany's tyranny. The United States did not enter the war for another year and a half. So when Paris fell, the German commander in that city made a courtesy call to the American military uh, and naval attaches at the U.S. Embassy and brought with him the very best brandy in Grillon, uh, which was the residence of the German military command in Paris. Four months after his arrival in London, <laughs> Kennedy tries to arrange a meeting with Adolf Hitler through the German ambassador to Great Britain, Herbert von Dirksen. In his meetings with von Dirksen, Kennedy spelled out his personal animosity towards Jewish people in reaction to the Germans' final solution to the Jewish problem, which was causing an uproar in Western countries. Kennedy tells von Dirksen, in his opinion, it was not so much the fact that we wanted to get rid of the Jews, it was that was so harmful to us, but rather the loud clamor with which we accomplished this purpose. So in other words, it's not about killing all of the Jews. It's just about all the, the bad press we're getting because of it. And these, those were Kennedy's remarks. Uh, Kennedy's remarks were picked up and reproduced in the United States, much to the chagrin of the president. However, if Roosevelt believed that his ambassador was finished making anti-British and anti-Semitic remarks, he was really in for a surprise. Uh, Kennedy, Kennedy did not endear himself to the British population dur during the German air raids in London. As the Blitz attacks grew stronger and stronger, Kennedy moved his family out of London to escape the raids. After touring the destruction, he remarked at how much he admired the local citizens for their bravery and fortitude in the face of such horrific German attacks. Uh, and in time, the papers began to call Kennedy Jittery Joe because you're the ambassador, 
you're there and you flee to save yourself. And then you want to remark how brave everybody else is because you're a fucking coward. And that's the way people saw it. On October 6th of 1940, uh, Kennedy pens a letter to Roosevelt asking that he be relieved of his duties in London and he demands that he be brought home. If his request was going to be denied, he would come home anyway. Uh, and the Roosevelt administration, who was already unhappy with everything that Kennedy was saying, uh, basically says, yeah, fine, you can come home. And he arrives back in New York on October 27th at LaGuardia. Uh, Roosevelt then asks Joe Kennedy and Rose Kennedy to come to see him at the White House when they arrived. Uh, so when they arrived, they took the train down to D.C. immediately. After dinner, Joe gave the president a piece of his mind. He told Roosevelt that he did not like the way he was treated in London, saying that he was kept out of the loop as far as policy formulation was concerned. He took a very direct swipe at the State Department, saying it was directly responsible for his being shut out of policymaking. So in other words, he wanted to make laws. He wanted to be the policymaker. You're a fucking ambassador. That's not your goddamn role. But this was Kennedy's ego. But it didn't stop him from saying like horrible anti-Semitic shit and anti-British shit. <laughs> fucking nut. So Joe basically arrived home one month, one month before the 1940 presidential election which FDR was running for an unprecedented third term. The press was aware of the growing issues between Roosevelt and Kennedy, and speculation was that the order of the day when it came to what trouble Kennedy might inflict on the campaign. And basically, Joe sees an opening. Uh, him and Roosevelt don't like each other, but Roosevelt needs him badly. And so what Joe does is he agrees, he agrees to make a radio speech endorsing Roosevelt which he actually paid for out of his own pocket. It cost 20 grand to get this done. He endorsed his Roosevelt, but said he still believed that it was wise for the United States to stay out of the European war. Even if Roosevelt hated Kennedy, he needed Catholic votes and he knew it. So whatever displaced anger he had at Kennedy for all the anti-Semitic shit that he was saying, Kennedy was, you know, like I said, he was known to use anti-Semitic slurs. And I'm not going to say those over the air. They're despicable uh, you could look them up for yourself. Uh, but Roosevelt, at the end of the day, could bypass his anti-Semitic viewpoints because he needed Catholic votes. And if Roosevelt thought that Kennedy was going to shut the fuck up, <laughs> he was wrong. So as the Roosevelt administration was debating whether or not to grant military aid to Britain, which was a March 1941 land lease deal that would eventually send 50 obsolete destroyers to Great Britain in exchange for leases from the British of a number of bases in the Caribbean. Kennedy <laughs> publicly speaks out against any U.S. action. He pissed off both Washington and London with these comments. Democracy is finished in English. In England, excuse me. It may be here, too, as well, referring to the United States. His remarks were published in the Boston Sunday Globe on November 10th of 1940. So here he is basically stumping for Roosevelt, but then like he's openly chastising him. It's just, it's crazy shit. Uh, Kennedy further embellished his remarks on the subject of the future democracy in the United States and Britain with the Boston Globe's Lewis Lyons and Ralph Colgan of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He said of the situation in Europe, it's all a question of what we do with the next six months. The whole reason for aiding England is to give us time. As long as she is there, we have to prepare. It isn't that she's fighting for democracy. That's the bunk. She's fighting for self-preservation. And just as we will if it comes to us. I know more about the European situation than anybody else. And it's up to me to see that the country gets it. Once again, know your role, Joe. He didn't. Uh, Kennedy fully rejected the belief of Winston Churchill that any compromise with Nazi Germany was impossible. Instead, he supports Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's policy of appeasement. Through 1938, while the Nazi persecution of the Jews in Germany intensified, Kennedy attempted to arrange another meeting with Adolf Hitler. Shortly before the Nazi bombing of British cities began in 1940, Kennedy once again sought another personal meeting with Hitler without the approval of the U.S. Department of State in order to bring about a better understanding between the United States and Germany. He was a Nazi sympathizer. And we're going to prove it. Uh, Kennedy's views become so erratic, unhinged, and inconsistent with uh, more isolationist type of beliefs. British Prime Minister Josiah Wedgwood, uh, who had himself opposed the British government's earlier appeasement policy, said of Kennedy, 
We have a rich man, untrained in diplomacy, unlearned in history and politics, who is a great publicity seeker who apparently is ambitious to be the first Catholic president of the United States. And he wasn't wrong. He was not off the mark there. Uh, According to Harvey Klemmer, who served as one of Kennedy's embassy aides, Kennedy habitually referred to Jews as kikes and sheenies. Kennedy allegedly Kennedy allegedly told Clemmer that uh, Jews are all some Jews are all right, Harvey, but as a race they stink. They spoil everything that they touch. While Clemmer returned from a trip to Germany and reported the pattern of vandalism and assaults on Jews by Nazis, Kennedy looked at him and said, "Well, they brought it upon themselves." Just despicable. Just despicable. On June thirteenth of thirty eight, Kennedy met in London with Herbert von Dirksen, who we talked about earlier, who was the German ambassador to the UK, who claimed upon his return to Berlin that Kennedy had told him that it was not so much the fact that we want to get rid of the Jews that was so harmful to people, but rather it's the loud clamor and publicity which we accompanied this purpose. Kennedy himself fully understood the Jewish policy. But Kennedy's main concern was such violent acts against German Jews as uh, Kristallnacht, which is, I think, something night, uh, that they generated bad publicity in the West for for the Nazi regime, a concern that he communicated in a letter to Charles Lindbergh. So Kennedy didn't give a shit the Jews were being slaughtered. He just didn't like the fact that it was giving America bad press. It's just disgusting. Uh, Kennedy actually had a close friendship with Viscountess Astor, and their correspondence is replete with anti-Semitic statements, according to Edward Renahan. As fiercely anti-communist as they were anti-Semitic, Kennedy and Astor looked upon Adolf Hitler as a welcome solution to both of these world problems. Kennedy replied that he expected the Jew media in the United States to become a problem and that Jew pundits in New York and L.A. were already making noises contrived to set a match to fuse the world. Kennedy, listen, it was a real piece of shit, just a fucking scumbag. And as all of that news hit the papers, Kennedy was taking a beating in public because everything that he said that was anti-Semitic kept showing up on the front pages. So while Kennedy sort of realizes that running for the Oval Office is probably going to be out of his wheelhouse now, uh, and even having problems with Roosevelt, he cuts a deal with him. He will give Roosevelt his unflinching support, helping him attain the Catholic votes that he needs. And in return, his son, Joe Jr., when he returns from war, was going to run for governor of Massachusetts in 42, and that Roosevelt would have to back him up 100%. But the problem was is that Joe Jr. was as much anti-Semitic as his father was, and he speaks out against Roosevelt, which just infuriates Roosevelt to no end. How the hell can you back somebody who's saying this awful shit about me? And it's worth noting that Joe Jr., Joe Kennedy Sr., sent his son, Joe Jr., prior to joining the military, to Nazi Germany in 1934. And Joe Jr. wrote a letter back to to his father saying that he loved Hitler and he praised him nonstop saying that Hitler's sterilization policy was a great thing and it would do away with many of the disgusting specimens of men. Basically, getting rid of the Jews was a great thing. Uh, He also says that Hitler was building a spirit in his men that could be envied in any country in the world. Disgusting. Uh, So whatever Joe Kennedy thought Roosevelt could do for his son would end up really being in vain. Uh, because Joe Kennedy left before his final year of law school at Harvard to enlist in the United States Naval Reserve. And on June 24th of 41, uh, he entered flight training to be a naval aviator, received his wings, and then he would be commissioned as an ensign on May 5th of 42. He would be assigned to Patrol Squadron 203 and then Bombing Squadron 110. In September of 43, he's sent to Britain, and he becomes a member of the Bomber Squadron 110. Uh, Special Air Unit 1, in 1944, he would pilot land based uh, PB 4Y Liberator patrol bombers on anti submarine details during two hour two tours of duty in the winter of 43 and 44. Kennedy would then be appointed a lieutenant on July 1st of 1944. He had completed 25 combat missions and was eligible to return home, but instead he volunteers for Operation Aphrodite. Uh, Operation Aphrodite basically made use of an uncrewed, explosive-laden Army Air Corps 
uh, Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress that the Navy consolidated PB-4Y-1 Liberator bombers that were deliberately crashed into the targets under radio control. So they were early versions of drones. Uh, these aircraft uh, could not take off safely on their own. And so basically a crew of two would get in the plane. They'd fly the plane to 2,000 feet before they activated the remote control system. They armed the detonators, and then they would jump out of the aircraft and parachute to the ground. After trials, the first mission would take place on August 4th of 44 against targets, including the fortress of Memo, I can't even, Memo Yakis, uh, which was an underground military complex under construction in northern France. The U.S. Navy also participated in Operation Aphrodite and its portion referred to as Operation Anvil. Kennedy had been appointed a lieutenant on July 1st after the U.S. Army Air Corps Operation missions were drawn up on July 23rd. Lieutenants Wilford John Willie and Kennedy were designated as the Navy's first Anvil flight crew. Willie, who was an executive officer of the Special Air Unit 1, had also volunteered for the mission uh, and pulled rank over Ensign James Simpson, who was Kennedy's regular co-pilot. So on August 12th, of, uh, on August 12th Kennedy and his co-pilot Willie flew a BQ-8 robot aircraft, a converted B-24 Liberator, for the Navy's first Aphrodite mission. Uh, initially, two Lockheed Ventura mother planes and a Boeing B-17 navigation took off from RAF First Field, Norfolk, England, at 1,800 hours on Saturday, August 12th of 1944. Then the BQ-8 aircraft loaded with 21,000 170 pounds of Torpex explosives took off to be used against the suspected V2 development site at Mimo Yaquez. I'm pronouncing that wrong. I know I am. Following them was a U.S. United States Air Force F-8 Mosquito to film the mission. Uh, was a pilot by the name of Robert Tunnel and a combat cameraman, Lieutenant David J. McCarthy, who filmed at the event from the Perspex nose of the aircraft. As planned, Kennedy and Willie remained aboard the BQ-8, and they completed their first remote control turn at 2,000 feet near the North Sea coast. Kennedy then, and Kennedy and Willie then removed the safety pin, arming the explosive package, and Kennedy radioed and agreed uh, to the code "Spade Flush," which were his last known words. Two minutes later. Well before the planned crew bailout near RAF Manston, the Torpex explosive detonated prematurely and destroyed the Liberator, killing Kennedy and Wilf Willie instantly. Wreckage landed near the village of Blythburg in Suffolk, England, causing widespread damage and small fires, but there were no injuries on the ground. According to one report, a total of 59 buildings were damaged in a nearby coastal town. Attempted first Aphrodite attack 12 August with robot taking off from... First field at 1805 hours. Robot exploded at the air approximately 2,000 feet, 8 miles southeast of Halesworth at 1820 hours. Wilford J. Willie Sr., Greg Lieutenant, and Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., Greg Lieutenant, both United States Navy, uh, were killed. Commander Smith in command of this unit is making a full report to U.S. Naval Operations. A more detailed report will be forwarded to you when the interrogation is completed top secret telegram to the general carl andrew spatz from general jimmy doolittle dated august of 1944 that's the actual i have the uh the telegram the top secret telegram so whatever hopes that joe kennedy senior had in his son were, were gone uh john kennedy as well would almost be killed in action in world war ii but we're not going to get into that today because next week we're going to be sort of discussing john f kennedy and more uh, and the curse had fully begun. Uh, in August of 1943, John was badly injured and narrowly escaped death in an attack on his boat by a Japanese destroyer. A little more than a year later, August 12th of 44, his brother Joe Kennedy Jr. is killed when his plane packed with explosives uh, exploded over southeast England. A month after that, the second Kennedy daughter, Kathleen, loses her husband of just four months, William John Cavendish, who was the Marquess of Harrington is killed in Belgium. Kathleen herself would die a few years later in a plane crash near St. Basile, France, while traveling with her intended second husband. Uh, Kennedy knew his political aspirations were done, and he knew in short order that getting Roosevelt reelected, which he did successfully, meant very little to him after the death of his son Joe Jr. His hopes and aspirations were now turned to his son John. 
However, during Roosevelt's re-election bid, Kennedy went all out, getting all of the Irish Catholic communities behind Roosevelt. And he especially got Chicago, Boston, New York, Pittsburgh, and New Jersey Irish Catholic communities to back Roosevelt and the re-election. It was important because what Joe was essentially doing was building a political national network of supporters that he could use down the line for his sons. He would also continue to use his minions at the New York Times to get his family good press. That relationship, specifically with Arthur Kroc, who was basically Kennedy's little bitch, would pay dividends not a decade later in, in many different ways. Remember, Kennedy's entire mantra was, buy what I can. And if I can't force them out, blackmail them or get them so much bad press, they have no other option but to deal with me. Eventually, Kroc would end up as a speechwriter and a political advisor to the Kennedy family. And that's where we're going to stop today, because next week. I'm going to unveil something nobody's ever spoken about. And what is that? Joe Kennedy was a fucking rat. He was an informant for the FBI and for J. Edgar Hoover for a long time. And I don't know how much I'm going to get into that, but rest assured, it's big. And I told you guys I was busting my balls on this. And as I said, I, I'm going to stop here only because next week is going to get very intense. And it won't be the end of JoJo the crime show. But we are going to detail JFK, how he grew up, his military career, and then kind of come right back to JoJo the crime show. Because Joe wants his son, John, to run. And John Kennedy didn't have any aspirations to run. That was not what he wanted to do. And he basically forces his son to run and he uses allies to get his son elected. And it's not going to be the biggest favor that Joe ever pulls the lever for. Because down the road, he's going to use mob ties and government ties. You know, the ones that the whole Kennedy family have denied ever being involved with. To get his son elected to the Oval Office. And there's a lot to get to, and I'm going to cover as much as I can without it being overbearing. So please, if you want to do me a favor, send me an email. Let me know what you think of the series thus far. MobTalkRadioShow at gmail.com. And we're not going to get into all the conspiracy-laden shit because it's just not prudent to organize crime, and that's what we talk about on this show. But we have a long way to go in the Kennedy series, so please give me a little feedback. Let me know what you guys think. And a lot of the reason why I didn't want to go right into John Kennedy today is because, you know, we got to talk about his youth. We're going to talk about going to college. We're going to talk about his military career and then how his father basically shoves him into running for office when he didn't want to do it. But it's because Joe Kennedy wanted it. And if he couldn't attain it himself, he would force his children to do it. And somehow he would get his jollies. But. The big thing is even with all of the, the powerful friends, the wealthy friends that Joe Kennedy had, he needed somebody to be a middleman between him and organized crime because he didn't want to be associated publicly, even though years later everybody saw him with Frank Costello here in New York. But he needed a guy who he could sit down and talk to, who would go back to organized crime and could be the parlay guy, the messenger guy. And that guy is going to be Frank Sinatra. And the reason why he uses Sinatra is because he needs Hollywood votes too. He needs the power of Hollywood. He needs Sinatra's friends. Now, surely Kennedy could have gone to Costello himself, but he did it a different way. And the reason why they did it that way wasn't because he couldn't, you know, approach Costello, but they knew down the road that John Kennedy to win in the Midwest, West Virginia, places like that, which had notoriously never voted for Catholics. There had never been a Catholic president before in the history of the United States. He knows they need favors. They need to rig, rig votes. And I've told the story before. A friend of mine's grandfather was during the Kennedy election, one of the poll people. And he told me 20 years ago, he's dead now, but he told me that when people came in to vote, no matter what they said, it was two for Kennedy, one for the other guy. So there were three votes per person. And those are facts. Did Kennedy win that election fairly? No, of course not. 
The mob helped in every way imaginable to get elected, get him elected because there were certain promises that were made. And those promises were big ones, but they were promises that Joe Kennedy never, ever intended to keep. Never. And everything that Joe had become in his life is going to get his son killed. Because if you believe for one minute, I mean, listen, and we'll get into it, but John F. Kennedy made a lot of bad decisions, a lot of bad decisions. He scared the other people in government. But if you think for one second that there wasn't part reaction because of his father, you'd be wrong. Because I think that had a lot more to do with it than people are ever going to fucking say. So join us next week, shall you? Have a great weekend, everybody.